Okay, let's go to the book of Revelation, Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22 and verse 1. This is where we got to last time. So we're looking at um, the eternal state. Not just heaven per se, but the reality of what life is like throughout eternity. And as we've looked at this for a few weeks, we recognize it's quite difficult to grasp. It's not easy to computate different dimensions and different uh, aspects of eternity and everlasting life because we're so limited to things here. But God gives us information to try and show us what uh, eternity will be like. So we've seen the new Jerusalem, the new city of God, which is almost like a planet in itself. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb. Down the middle of the great street of the city on each side of the river stood the tree of life bearing 12 crops of fruit, yielding its fruit every month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. No longer will there be any curse. The throne of God and of the Lamb will be in the city, and his servants will serve him. They will see his face, and his name will be on their foreheads. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp or the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light, and they will reign forever and ever. So as we're going through chapter 22, God's showing us the things we need, the things we don't need, the things we will have, the things we won't have. And some of the things we won't have are really things that we would think we would need because God created them originally at Genesis. And so this is why God gives a description of things that are not there which is rather strange if you remember when we looked at this, because why would he explain things that are not there if he created them in the first place? Why would he create them and then not need them? Because they're signs, they're symbols, they're pictures of a greater reality. You talk to any true scientist, there was a statement made in uh, a journal in America, I think it was Scientific American a few years ago, and the scientists confirmed that Everything we know, all the particles, all the mass, all the matter, everything in the universe is but a tiny shadow of a greater reality we don't know how to tap into. And they give various names for it, but we only know a tiny fraction of reality. It's got to be there, but we can't see it. But it's got to be there because the mathematics to, to work out the gravity and everything, it's not there. And so... And that's now, in, in eternity, it's even more so. And so we've got a picture of things that are not there. So if you can just put up that chart that we've looked at before, it shows us the things that are not there. Okay, these are not going to be there. There's going to be no more sea. We looked at that. And remember, all these things were created in Genesis at the beginning. Okay, there's no, light, there's no night. But you'll notice when God created everything... He said there was day and there was night. There was Eved, there was Boker, there was day, there was night. Why, if there's no night, did God create everything with night? We've looked a little bit at that. There will be no more night. Last time we looked at the curse, there will be no curse. Not go through that again. There'll be no more curse there. There'll be no temple there, even though massive parts of the whole Bible all the way through describe a temple. But there won't be one. So why have we got all that information about it if we don't need to know it because it's not going to be there? We're going to look at that. There'll be no more sun, Shemesh. There'll be no more moon, Yerik. There'll be no sinners. I think we all sort of get that one. Yeah, the sinners that are there will be saved by grace and will be purified and holy. So we know these things are not there because we've looked at that. We've looked at the reasons why. And... Um, we've looked at how things were created in Genesis, but I just want us to focus on one of these again to try and help us to see something. So number four there on the chart, it says there'll be no temple there. Now to us, 
um, Western modern Christians, we can sort of get his head around that. But to the Jew, they wouldn't have quite understood that because they're focused on the temple being rebuilt. To them, the temple was the habitation of God. So if there's no God, there's no presence from where which God can dwell. There's got to be a temple. Even though when they built the temple, Solomon said, well, will, will God dwell in, uh, you know, a house made by human hands, a temple made in stone? But it's not just the temple, is it? Because the temple was a whole system of different things. So when it says there's no temple there, when you think the temple was built, there were certain things in the temple. Right? It's not just the temple structure. There's, there's different items of furniture. There's different holy, sacred artifacts, if you want to use that word, different functions, different utensils, different things that once again, throughout the Bible, God goes into massive detail, listing them and describing them and how they're to be made and they're to be made of gold and, and certain kinds of wood. And why all that if they're not going to be there? Why do we need to know? Is it just an object lesson? Is it just a, um, a metaphor? Is it just a picture? Well, let's go to the, let's go to the next list. So the obvious thing that's not going to be there. So there's a missing temple. Right. There was a temple on earth. You all know that. Yeah. Before, there were actually two temples made in stone. Yeah. There was, uh, there was Solomon's temple. And then it was built later when Ezra and Nehemiah returns, a Rubbervil's temple that was then added to by Herod the Great in the time of Jesus. But before that, there was a tabernacle. Yeah, and before that, they were in the Garden of Eden. And if you've read my book, The Garden of God, it describes how the garden was a, a temple. Was a te and the temple was supposed to look like a garden. But that was on earth. I've put there Revelation 11, 19. Let's, let's go there. Let's go to Re Revelation eleven nineteen, which we did look at uh, <laughs> three years ago. So I'm sure you can't remember. So then God's temple in heaven was opened, not the temple on earth. So there's a temple in heaven. But in the eternal state, there is no temple. So why is the one in heaven? The one on earth was destroyed because of disobedience. has never been rebuilt, but there is going to be another temple rebuilt. The Bible's clear about that. And so... God's temple in heaven was opened, and within his temple was seen uh, the ark of his covenant. So you know that the temple wasn't just the dwelling of God. There was another part of the temple that was the holy of holies, that was the real sacred um, dwelling place of, of God, the, the Kodesh or Kodeshim, the, the holy of holies. And there came flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, earthquake, and a severe fit. Uh, Hailstorm. So this is a temple in heaven, not the temple on earth. Does it look like the one on earth? Yes, because when Moses made the temple, God said, make it in a, the exact blueprints, the description, as you have seen on the mountain. So it, it's a copy. Why? Why is the two? Does God like, like a second home? It's like, oh, I'm going to earth for the weekend. Right? But not only is there a temple in heaven, there's the Ark of the Covenants in heaven. I thought it was in a warehouse in America. <laughs> because they took it off Indiana Jones. So there's, there's the Ark of his Covenant in heaven. How did that get? Or, or is it... Is it a duplicate? So if we can just go to that, that second chart, Ethan. So there's, but there's going to be, that's not going to be in the eternal state, is it? Because the Bible tells us there's no, there's no temple there. John, John says, I saw no temple there. Yeah, we, we've read that in Revelation 21 and 22. He sees no temple in heaven. The temple's not in the new city. But when Ezekiel sees the millennium, there is a temple in the millennium on earth, but there isn't going to be one in the eternal state. So there's going to be no temple there. And so 
Um, why? Now, temples mentioned 14 times in Revelation, and there is a temple in heaven, and there is going to be one rebuilt on earth, because there always has been, but then there's the contents of the temple that God's building. So, we've just read that in Revelation 11, 19. Can we go to Re Revelation 15 and verse 5? Just to remember what we've seen in Revelation. Revelation 15, verse 5. So after this I looked and I saw in heaven the temple. So it's not just a one-off. He sees this several times, 14 times, temples mentioned in Revelation. I saw in heaven the temple, that is the tabernacle. So it's not just the temple, it's the tabernacle. Remember the tabernacle is the temple, but it's built of material, whereas the temple was built in stone. But the dimensions is the same. It's a three-part process temple and the same functions and the same furniture. So it's the same thing. It's just one when one uh, fell into disrepair and the material corroded, they built one out of stone. So that is the tabernacle of the covenant law and it was open. So we've seen the temple, but we've also seen the ark. So in the temple, there's the furniture that is associated with the temple, all the different pieces. And so that's in heaven as well. Yeah? So, why isn't it there in the eternal state? Why isn't it there? Well, it is. It is there. Because God's plan was always, as you know, and we've looked at this, you already know this. Although John in Revelation 21 sees no temple in heaven, he, in the eternal state, he sees the city of God, which are the people of God in whom God dwells. So we are the temple of God. We, we know that the church is the temple of God. But in the eternal state, that reality is finally realized. It is true now, but there's still a temple in heaven now. But there isn't going to be. The only the, the dwelling that God has in the eternal state says, I will dwell with my people. You really are going to be the habitation of God. The city of God is the bride. The city of God are the people of God. The city of God is the church. So it's not that there's no temple, that John sees no physical temple. It's that we really are the temple. Now, I'm sure we've seen that before. But if we go back to the chart, it's not just the physical temple. What about all the other stuff? What about all the other stuff that's, that's not there? So what else is in the temple? The Ark of the Covenant, what else? The incense, the menorah, the menorah, the, the candlestick, the seven-branched candlestand, bring it down. So in the temple was the, the menorah, the gold menorah of, of hammered gold. So basically, what is that? It's a big lamp. It's a big lamp that gives light to everyone in the temple, yeah? But there's, there isn't one in the eternal state, is there? That's in heaven. There's a sevenfold spirit in heaven. Doesn't mention it in the eternal state, though. Heaven as it is now is different to what the eternal state is going to be. Yeah? Go to Revelation 4, verse 5. Let me just... I want us to see this. It's not, this isn't something you don't already know. It's just, I want us to clearly see it. Okay. So, Revelation 4, 5, this is what's just been mentioned. From the throne came flashes of lightning, rumblings and peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. These are the seven spirits of God. So, this, the seven lamps, the menorah's seven lamps, is in heaven. But, it's, but there's not, there isn't one in the eternal state. We've got to get us to see the eternal state isn't heaven as we see it. It's something far beyond that. Infinitely beyond that. Extra dimensional. Transcendent even above what heaven is now. Remember, John doesn't just see a new earth. He sees new heavens. Hash, shamayim in, in Hebrew, heaven is always plural. You can't say heaven. It's heaven's. It's plural, Hashem, Mayim, Mayim, plural. And so the, the lamp stands in heaven, yeah? 
So go to the eternal state. Let's go to Revelation 22, verse 5, what we've just read at the beginning. So Revelation 22, verse 5. There will be no more night. They will not need the light of a lamp. Ner in Hebrew. So it's not that there isn't a lamp. There is a lamp. It's just you don't need the menorah. All the light of the sun, for the Lord God will give them light and they will reign forever and ever. So we understand that not just the temple, but everything in the temple is superseded by a greater reality, by a greater manifestation of not just the God's presence, but his presence through the church. So if you go back to Revelation 1, Ethan, please, Revelation 1 verse 12, Revelation 1 verse 12, right at the beginning where we started, this study, I turned around to see the voice I was speaking to me, and when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. Now, John's on earth, so he sees the lampstand on earth, and then in chapter 4, he's caught up, and he sees the lampstand in heaven, and then in verse 20, can we go to verse 20 of, of chapter 1? When the voice speaks to him, the mystery of the seven stars you saw in my right hand of the seven golden lampstands is this. The seven stars are the angels of the seven churches and the seven lampstands are the seven churches. So there is a lamp in the eternal state. It just won't be an artificial one. It'll be a living one. It will be the church united with God. Yeah? So there is a lamp. There's no temple. There's no menorah but there is the seven lamps, but it's now one light through uh, the lamb being our light and through God being our light. But there's no moon and there's no sun. Right, now here's a question. The, the tree of life still gives its fruit every month. How do you measure a month? Twelve months, it says. Twelve lots of fruit. Remember, everything's twelves in the New Jerusalem. But we measure a month according to the solar calendar. There is no solar calendar. So how do you measure it? Well, the 24-hour, oh, hold on, there's no night. Can you see? Everything's going to be totally different, but yet there's still going to be months. There's still going to be a 12 12 foot process, there's still going to be the fruit every month. So there still is time going on, but it's a different concept than what we have. So there's no night, there's no day, there's no sun, there's no moon. There's still months. Are the months the same length as they are now? I don't know. I don't know. I don't even know if time is measured the same way it is now. But just to get us to, to, to grasp this, the whole... You know, we, Jesus says, you are the light of the world. He's saying a lot more than you think when he says that. Don't, don't, let, don't hide your light under a bushel, right? What was in the temple? Bushels. In the temple, each priest wouldn't just have a censer with a fire in it to light the lights and the incense. It would also have a bushel. Jesus says, don't hide your light under the bushel. We've looked at that before, so I'll not go into what that means. I think we looked at that in the, uh, the light series. So if you want to know more about that, look at that. So that's not there, but the light's, the light's there, greater than ever. Okay, go back to the chart then. So the temple's not there, the menorah's not there. Of course, the menorah's fulfilled in the seven churches, seven being the completion of fulfillment. There's no more sea. We read that. In Revelation 21, verse 1, I saw no more sea. But yet, go back to Revelation 4, verse 6. So this is when John's first caught up to, into heaven again. Revelation chapter 4, verse 6. So he goes into the throne room where he sees the menorah, the seven lamps, and, he see, and the, the temple, and he sees the Ark of the Covenant. And, and in front of the throne, there was what looked like a sea of glass. So there's a sea in heaven. Yeah, but there isn't one in the eternal state. So there's a sea on earth, there's a sea in heaven, but there isn't a sea after the millennium when, when God creates new heaven and a new earth. There's still water, and the sea obviously was the place in the temple. You remember some, some of the translations will call it the, the basin, it's, but 
the authorized called it the sea. And that was where people would uh, wash themselves to be ceremonially clean. Well, you won't need to do that because you are clean. Because only the clean are in the eternal state. Everything that's unclean, as we've read there in, in Revelation, isn't allowed in. It's, it's put outside. So the, the life, the water's there, the Haimayim, the river of life, that's there, but the sea's not there. Right? So the basin's not there. But the life, the river of water, is flowing from the Lamb and from the throne. And if you remember these different things, it's the temple of God, it's the Lamb and God who are the lamp, and it's the river of life, it's the Holy Spirit. So you've got all three members of the Trinity there replacing these things, but through us. Okay. So another item of furniture in the temple. There's only, there's not, there's only seven of them. Yeah, there's two altars. Let's, let's put that up. Next one. Uh, actually, the next one I don't think is the altar. No, the next one is the table, the golden table. So, the golden table was where you put the bread, the showbread, the golden table where you put 12 different pieces of bread for the 12 tribes of Israel. Now, in, in ancient antiquity, um, even I saw this when I was in India recently, they, in the temples they will, and at the altars, they will bring food and they will give food to their gods. And so you would literally see them burning candles at the side of the road. And then some of them, they would leave food and they would just leave it there to rot because it's for the gods. I mean, I would have figured out a long time ago, well, he's not hungry <laughs> because he's not getting eaten. Now, in God's temple, although the bread was put out, it wasn't for God to eat, right? It was for the priests. So it was put out of the symbol actually, that God is the bread. It's, it's a strange concept to most temples of antiquity because you gave the food, you gave the gift to God. But actually, in God's temple, no, it's God that's giving you the food. And so the, there's no table of bread there um, because God's not hungry. But that's not the point. The point is, if we go to Revelation 7, verse 15... Revelation 7, verse 15. Therefore they are before the throne of God. So this is heaven now, not the eternal state. They are before the throne of God and serve him day and night in his temple. And he who sits on the throne will shelter them with his presence. One more verse. Never again will they hunger. Right? So in other words, God's satisfying them. But in the eternal state... When we go into eternity, it's the tree of life that gives the food. So there is food there, but there's no need for that table to be there. So the items in the temple, there is no temple. They go back to God's original plan, which was the tree of life. Not the, temp not the temple system, as we understand it. That was to bring them into the reality of what God was trying to bring restoration to. But in the eternal state, God is going back to his original plan. He's putting everything as he originally intended it. The temple system was actually an intermediate state to get them to this greater realization that we're all heading towards. One of the promises to the churches, remember, was I'll give you some of the hidden manna. You, you, you'll not hunger. And one of the other promises was uh, you'll be able to eat from the tree of life in the eternal state. So the table isn't there. Go back to the chart then. This is what someone just said. So the next one, um, there's the golden altar. Remember, there's two altars. There's the bronze altar, the brazen altar that's just outside the temple in the courtyard. And then you've got the golden altar, which is where the, the incense is given. So, is there an altar in heaven? It's not a trick question. Yes. How do you know? Yeah, it says so. Honestly, you don't trust me at all, do you? <laughs> because it says so. 
I mean, put it there. Revelation 8, verse 3. Revelation chapter 8 and verse 3. Another angel, so this is, this is John caught up to heaven, not the eternal state. That's coming much later. This is heaven. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. Well, if the angel's got a golden censer, yeah, and it says he's given the incense much to offer, and he's come to the golden altar, then, he's, then obviously there is a golden incense altar in heaven. Yeah? Obviously, because it says there is. And the angel gives that incense with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. Yeah? Where was the golden altar in the temple? In front of the what? In front of the what? It is in front of the Holy of Holies. Yes. We'll look at that in a minute. Let's remember what that actually is. So there is an altar in heaven, but there isn't one in the eternal state. Why? There doesn't need to be. Because the altar, the golden altar, is where we give our worship and praise and prayers, the, the incense that rises as, as praise and prayers to God. Well, we're going to do that. You don't need an altar. Because in the eternal state, you will directly be able to release that praise, that prayer, face to face, as God said. That's why it says in Corinthians, now we, we worship as in, as in a hidden, but then we will know him face to face. We will know him e even as he's fully known, as we are fully known. And so, if you go to Revelation 22 verse 9... The altar's mentioned more than once. It's mentioned in Revelation chapter 9 as well. So if you go to Revelation 22 and verse 9, the angel's telling him not to worship. Don't do that. I am a fellow servant with you and your fellow prophets with all who keeps the words of this scroll. Worship God. Now, I know this sounds obvious, and I don't need to say this, but there will be worship in the eternal state. It's just you won't be doing it at a golden altar. You'll be doing it directly to God. And this is why when John's caught up and he's now seeing the eternal state, the angel's saying, what are you doing? I'm an angel. You don't worship me. You're now the eternal state. You worship God directly. You see him face to face. You know him. He knows you. There's no veil there. Remember that altar, when you worshipped at that altar, there's a, there's a veil in front. God's the other side of the veil. In the temple system, you're worshipping at the golden altar, but you can't see God. But in the eternal state, we do see him. In fact, we see everything by the light of his countenance. Yeah. So the worship is there. Let's go back to the chart. So the golden altar isn't required. And these are why these things are not there. Uh, the next one is the other altar, uh, the brazen altar or the altar of sacrifice. So if you go to Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9, is that altar in heaven? Yes, it is. You see, we are conditioned to think of heaven means eternity. It doesn't. Right? When we're looking at the eternal state, we're not talking about heaven. We're talking about eternity. The new Jerusalem comes out of heaven. The new Jerusalem's not in heaven. One of the problems with our Renaissance mind is when we say eternity, you think you're going to be in heaven for all eternity. Well, you're not. Who knows where you're going to be for all eternity? God might send you to a galaxy far, far away. <laughs> He creates a new universe, right? Don't have this limited, constrained view that what the description of the new Jerusalem is the only place you're going to be. Why would you think that? Even angels don't stay there. They travel all over the place. The Hebrew word malak literally means messengers, spirits that are moving about all the time. So who knows what star systems or galaxies are? I'm, I'm, you know, it's conjecture. I don't know what eternity is going to bring, but I know the universe is a pretty big place now. And so 
When I'm saying heaven, don't think, oh, eternity. No, that's not what it means. Heaven is a place. Eternity is an everlasting concept. It's any place, right? There's three parts to heaven. Third heaven, uh, probably we're looking at here, the, the abode of God, the dwelling of God. We've looked at that before. So is there a, this altar in heaven? Yes, there isn't one in the eternal state, right? God, there aren't, people aren't killed in the eternal state, right? So go to, um, have we gone there? Revelation 6 and verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, so this is John seeing heaven, not the eternal state. He's seeing into heaven, not eternity. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. So this is the altar of sacrifice, people who have given their lives to God. And, and, and all throughout heaven, Jesus is called the lamb, right? Well, any Jew would know the, the lamb is the, is the animal that's been put on that altar and sacrificed, Right, so the sacrificial altar. When John sees uh, Jesus, he sees the lamb as it has been slain. Right, he's seen a lamb that's on the sacrificial altar in heaven or has been on that. He's now alive. He actually sees him now on the throne. But so the concept is in heaven, there is, the martyrs, God is recognizing that, that sacrificial aspect. In the eternal state, Right, not heaven, though it includes heaven, in the eternal state. In fact, just go to Revelation 5, verse 6. Revelation 5, verse 6. So when, when John is caught up to heaven, not the eternal state, heaven, then I saw a lamb looking as if it has been slain, standing at the center of the throne. So a lamb that has been slain is a lamb that's come off the altar of sacrifice. That the Jew, that's what a slain lamb has been on the sacrificial altar. And then we've seen the, then they just showed us the altar in, uh, in Revelation, in heaven. There is no sacrificial altar in the eternal state because there's no death yeah totally different concept to what we understand today so go with, go to revelation chapter 21 and verse 22 revelation 21 22 so in the eternal state not heaven i'm gonna to have to keep saying that i think I did not see a temple in the city, the eternal state, not heaven. There is a temple in heaven because the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. The city does not need the sun or the moon to shine on it for the glory of God gives it light and the Lamb is its lamp. The in the eternal state, what is Jesus called? The lamb. You don't need a sacrificial altar. You can see the sacrifice. He's called the lamb. Now, maybe next time or the time after, we might look at what Jesus is actually called in Revelation. But the thing he's mainly called is the lamb, right? That's, a not, that's not a nice poetic word for Jesus. It's not Mary had a little lamb. No, oh, Jesus is a white fluffy lamb. No, it's a lamb that's been slain. It's a lamb that's been cut up. It's a lamb that's been sliced open. It's not pretty, but John sees the lamb. So that he doesn't see the sacrificial altar anymore, but he sees the lamb. For all eternity, he's called the lamb. Even in the eternal state, not just in heaven, at the throne now, in the eternal state he's called the Lamb. Yeah, we've just read it there. The Lamb is its temple. The Lamb is the light, but it's the Lamb. When you see Jesus, you will see the wounds that you caused for all eternity. They'll never be taken away. Your sin is taken away. The proof of your forgiveness is never taken away. 
You will see it. There will be no sacrifice needed. Jesus has given the ultimate sacrifice. There's none needed now throughout all eternity. He gave the, the sacrifice once and for all that was sufficient for all sins forevermore. And so he's called the lamb. So the temple system is not required because it was primarily about sacrifice, although there were other important aspects to it. Now, in the book of Revelation and the, the Gospel of John, because John wrote both of them, do you know how many times the word lamb is mentioned? It's not seven. We've, we've read seven just there. We've only read two chapters. It isn't 49, no. Let's just start at one and go to 400, shall we? It's a lot. Now, I actually counted them uh, not so long ago. And it's the word lamb is mentioned 36 times, which upset me. Because it's not a multiple of seven. In fact, it really upset me. So I sat there for ages thinking, I must have counted wrong. <laughs> so I got my lexicon out and I got my concordance out and I looked at the different and I counted it and I kept getting 36. And so I thought, y you know when you just know it can't be 36. <laughs> it's like something, you've got to be careful. You haven't got to try and contrive and make stuff up. But sometimes I'm just thinking, oh, come on. We've just looked at all the sevens over and over and over, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of them. And there's no way the lamb can't be a multiple of seven. And so how come I've counted and counted and recounted and I keep getting the word lamb 36 times? And as I sat there, it suddenly came to me. Because in Revelation, the word lamb is mentioned once, and it's not Jesus. It's the Antichrist who looks like a lamb. And I was just counting, you see, I was just counting the words, lamb. Because I just thought, well, it always refers to Jesus, but one occasion it doesn't. It refers to the Antichrist who imitates the lamb, which means it's mentioned 35 times, which is five times seven. Five is the number of grace. Seven is the number of perfection. Jesus, the lamb, is perfect grace. So aren't you glad I sat and thought about that for a while? <laughs> I knew I must be wrong. We worship the Lamb for all eternity. He will be called the Lamb. For all eternity, you will, every time you look at him, you'll say, those wounds were for me. That, that slicing, that cutting, those nail prints, those holes, that was for me. He's the Lamb. There's no need for a sacrifice anymore. There's no need for a sacrificial altar anymore. All dealt with. Okay, one other piece of temple furniture that we've not mentioned don't put it up. We have mentioned it, but we haven't. No, that, that's, yeah, there's, there's all the plates and sensors and the, the bushels and all that equipment, but there's one that's not there. We have mentioned it, but we, we've not looked at it. You've all mentioned, you've mentioned it twice. The Ark of the Covenant, the most important piece, yeah? So there's, there's no Ark in heaven, is there? Thank you. <laughs> Because if, if you'd have said no, then, yes, there is an ark in heaven. There isn't an ark in the eternal state, right? There, there's, there's an ark. Go to Revelation. In fact, this is where we started off. Revelation 11, verse 19. Let's go there. Revelation 11, 19. Is there an ark in heaven? Yes. Why? We'll see why in a minute. In God's then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within the temple was seen the ark of his covenant. Not the ark of the covenant. The ark of the covenant is on earth. The ark of his covenant is in heaven, because a covenant has two parts to it. So, there is an ark in heaven, but the ark isn't there, or at least not there by name, in the eternal state. Because, as Pastor John said, 
His throne is there. Now the ark was God's throne. Yeah, go to Revelation 22, verse 1. So the ark, the mercy seat, remember it's a seat, it's where God is enthroned above the, the, the cherubim. God is enthroned above the ark. The angel showed me the river of the water of life as clear as crystal flowing from the throne of God and the Lamb. So that is the ark, or rather the ark is the throne. And so in the eternal state, the, the contents of the ark are not there because the throne of God, the place of his rule is there. But it doesn't call it the ark, does it? calls it the Ark of His Covenant. And God's very precise on calling it that. And the lid was the mercy, mercy seat where His throne is, but it's called the Ark of His Covenant. And if you remember, when we just looked there in the temple, it says the temple of the covenant, the tabernacle of the covenant. Why does God stress the covenant. He doesn't just call things, he calls it of the covenant. And so one of the things, if we're going to grasp what the eternal state is, if we're going to grasp the, the blessings of the eternal state, we've got to understand what the covenant is. Because that's what it all revolves around. So if I were to say to you, covenant which is mentioned here in Revelation, and this is what we're told that we must look at. What do we think when we think of the word covenant? Now, unfortunately, because of translation issues, we, we call the Bible um, the Old and New Testaments, but actually it's the word covenant. Testament's just the old English word for covenant. We really did ought to stop mistranslating. We ought to call everything the same thing, or it does get confusing. So we know there's an old and new covenant, because our Bible is split into two. We call them testaments, but it's, it's the word covenant. It's, it's the covenant of God. Now, we've seen that in heaven, God has... The, 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 the reality that, or the symbols or the, the aspects of the covenant in heaven. The temple, the tabernacle of the covenant, the ark of the covenant is in heaven now. Yeah? And so in heaven, we've got the ratification of these covenants. Um, now, in, in Hebrew, the word covenant is berit, berit. In, in Greek, it's diatheke. Um, and that word is mentioned well over 300 times in the Bible. So as you can imagine, it's a very, very important concept in the Bible. Covenant. Covenant. What does it mean? Well, a covenant is a legal, judicial, uh, Binding agreement that is consensually, um, con contractually entered into by two parties with um, consequences on either party. I think that's as good a way of saying it as I can think of. And so we have covenants today. Um, you have, a, if you're married, you have entered into a marriage covenant. You have entered into a covenant which is legally binding on oath. It's judicially ratified um, and you voluntarily consensually do it. And there are consequences for breaking it. And there are obligations upon either party who have entered into that covenant. Yeah, that's, that's what a covenant is. Now, in the Bible, there are lots of covenants. A lot of covenants are just between two people of, of equal standing. We would call that a parity covenant. So if you can remember the story of uh, David and Jonathan, they swore a covenant together. They says, I'm never going to harm your family, because remember, Jonathan's dad was trying to kill David. And so in, in that tribal 
uh, atmosphere and culture, what you would do is if one, it was, you know, if one family was attacking you, you would wipe out that family before they could hurt your family. You know, it was that kind of tribal um, culture where you would literally take vendettas and vengeance against each other. So if his dad did something to your dad, you'd kill his son and he'd kill your son. And, and there'd be that conflict just going on throughout generations. Still happens sometimes uh, in the Middle East that they call it sometimes a culture of honor, but it's certainly not honorable. And so they swore a covenant together and, and they kept it. Jonathan died, but when, when, when it came to execute Jonathan's son, Mephibosheth, David refused. He said, no, I swore a covenant. He will always eat at my table. Uh, that, but that's a, that's a covenant between two equal people. So there's that kind of covenant. Um, that kind of covenant happens a lot in the Bible. Um, go to Genesis 21, verse 32. Genesis 21, verse 32. So this is a covenant, a treaty, made between Abraham and the leader of the Palestinians, sorry, Philistines. It's the same word. After the treaty had been made at Beersheba, Abimelech and Phicol, the commander of his forces, returned to the land of Philistines. Remember, what you see in Genesis is a picture of what's going to happen in the end times. There is going to be a covenant made, just like there was then, between the leader of the Philistines, Palestinians, and the children of Abraham. Did they keep that covenant? Well, no, the Philistines attacked Israel. And it wasn't until David came that they fought back. And so just understand that just because a covenant's been made doesn't mean it's going to be kept. It depends on who made it. Right, that's why the Bible's very clear, don't enter into covenant with people unless you are absolutely sure you know what you're doing because it will be legally binding upon you. So that's when, you know, when the Bible says don't swear by heaven or earth, you know, just let your yes be yes and your no be no because once you swear, you legally bind yourself to that and then if that person then is wicked to you, you are still legally bound by your oath. You shouldn't have made the oath because you've actually tied yourself into something that's going to destroy you. That's why you're not to do it. And so it's interesting that when Antichrist comes, what we're told in Daniel's prophecy is that he will enter into a covenant with God's people and God's people will enter into a covenant with him. But he's going to break that covenant. His plan is to kill them. But they shouldn't have entered into him. When Jesus came to bring the covenant, they rejected him. Jesus says, I come in my father's name, you reject me, but you're going to accept one who comes in his own name. That's going to happen. He's called Antichrist, the man of sin. Daniel calls him the, the, the wicked king. And so this covenant is mentioned, or different kinds of covenant are mentioned throughout the whole Bible. Jacob and Laban had a covenant not to harm each other. But that's not really what we're talking about. We're not talking about a parity covenant. We're talking about a covenant that God makes. And this, this is still mentioned hundreds of times, but there's not hundreds of these. And so there's just a few. In fact, does anyone want to guess how many there is? There are seven. There are seven. Some people say there are eight because they split one into two parts, which is fair enough, but it's still really one covenant. And so when God makes a covenant... Now, the, the technical name for this is called a Caesarean vassal covenant. Basically, it just means someone really, really important, like a king, makes a covenant with a bunch of plebs. <laughs> In other words, if you're really, really rich and important and better than everybody, what kind of covenant do you make with people that can't really do anything for you? I mean, what, what are you going to do? It's not a parity covenant, is it? Because they can't do anything for you. And so a king would sign a covenant saying, look, if you pay your taxes to me, 
I'll make sure you're looked after. I'll make sure, you know, that uh, enemy nations don't attack you. I'll make sure you're fed. I'll make sure there's a proper legal system and et cetera, et cetera. And, and, and it's a covenant. It's a covenant. The king would literally stand up and declare, usually at his inauguration in the ancient Near East, that's what they would do. And this is the covenant, really, that we're looking at in the Bible. And so God started off creation with a covenant. He started that off in Genesis. In fact, let's go there. Let's go to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1, verse 26. Genesis 1, verse 26. So God said, Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they may rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. One more verse. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. So God's image is actually man and woman together. If there's a bit missing, God's image is not full. And so God creates an agreement at the beginning of creation, that man and woman are to rule earth. And they're created to have authority, dominion. I like that word dominion. It means proper rulership as kings and queens, really, in the, in the language that's used, over God's creation. You've got a perfect man, you've got a perfect woman, and they are in covenant over God's creation. Yeah? So go to the next chapter, Genesis chapter 2. Genesis 2 and verse 16. Now, the covenants of God are always mentioned several times. They're mentioned more than once. Uh, a covenant always has to be ratified at least twice by two parties. And the Lord God commanded the man, you are free to eat from any tree in the garden, but you must not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, for when you eat from it, you will certainly die. So remember, a covenant has legally binding agreements that each party says they will obey. So God's, God's covenant is this. Rule, have authority, eat everything you want, but if you don't eat that or you'll die, right? Did they keep the covenant? No. It wasn't even hard, was it? I mean, it wasn't hard, but I could have kept that. I'd have just told myself that weren't, that weren't really nice. Think of some food you don't like, and it's like, oh, that, that tree of knowledge, it tastes like that. Licorice. I don't like licorice. It tastes like licorice. Don't eat it. They didn't. They got deceived by Satan, and so they ate from the tree. The consequences of breaking that covenant was death. They still broke it. And so, can you bring up that chart, please, Ethan? We'll look at these covenants. Let's just bring up the first one. So, the, 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 the Edenic covenant, the covenant in Eden... It was a conditional covenant. In other words, once you've broke it, you die. It's like you've broke it, you die. Can't you change your mind, God? No. Because you've brought sin now into the world, and the, and the wages of sin is death. So you have now released death into my creation. The covenant is broken. It was conditional. You mustn't do that. You did it. What was the covenant made with? All mankind. Adam. Adam is the Hebrew word for man. It was, it was made with mankind and woman. They broke it. So now we've all broke that covenant. We've all eaten the fruit we shouldn't have eaten. We've all sinned. We're all going to die. You can't say, oh, oh no, I'll change my mind. It's, it's too late. The covenant's broke. The covenant has gone. Death now reigns, the Bible tells us, from Adam till Christ. And so... The, the, the evidence of that was the fruit they'd eaten. Yeah? So the evidence was the fruit they had eaten. Now, just a, 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 something to note here. The evidence of these covenants is in heaven as well as earth. Right? 
there's the tree of life in heaven. The fruit, the good fruit that man can't eat, that side of the covenant is still there. God keeps his side of the bargain. The Ark of the Covenant is still there. The Temple of the Covenant, the Tabernacle of the Covenant is still there. God still kept his side of the bargain. He's not broke the covenant we have. Right, let's go down to the next one. This might get clearer as you look at it. So, mankind existed for a thousand years or so, a bit more. And so then, uh, God has to destroy sinful man because it gets so wicked. Everyone's killing each other. There's the perversion, the immorality, but there's the Nephilim, the infiltration of demonic and fallen angels producing, you know, all kinds of weird creatures. And so now God has to destroy everything through a flood. And so he brings Noah out of, the, out of the ark and his family. You know the story in Genesis chapter 9. And so they all come out of the ark. Now, just think for a minute. God's killed everybody for doing something wrong. The way that he killed everybody was flooding them so that they all drowned. So, you're in the ark. Would you get out? After you've been in the ark here and the floodwaters have gone, would you get out of the ark? Remember, if you sin, God's going to kill you by flooding the earth. Would you get out of the ark? Would you think, oh, I'm fine, I won't sin. I'll get out of the ark because I'm not going to do anything wrong. I'm all right, Gov. I'll be fine. I'll just, I'll, I'll, you know, I'll build a farm and I'll, I'll have this livestock and I'll just get. Now, if that was me, I'm not as good as you. But if that was me, I'd sort of like, I'd make sure the ark was pretty close because the minute I do something wrong, it's going to start raining again. Because <laughs> God's already said I can't tolerate wickedness. Yeah. So that's a, lo that's a pretty logical conclusion, isn't it? If you know God's killed everybody through, through the flood because of sin, if you're a half-decent moral person with any brain, you know, well, I'm going to sin again. I'm going to do something wrong. So I'm not getting out the ark because God's going to, set, it's going to start raining again. And, and it, it did rain again. I mean, can you imagine the first time it rained? Can you imagine Noah and Mrs. Noah and, you know, Ham and Japheth and they sat there and Shem and, you know, they sat there, you know, having a sandwich. It starts raining. I mean, what, you, what do you think? Ah, get it out, kill them, they move together again. Get everybody back, get that giraffe in the ark, break its neck, I don't care, get it in. <laughs> we, we've got to do it all again. I mean, you wouldn't be able to function, would you? You'd be terrified every time you saw a cloud. And so they're worshipping God, and so God gives them a new covenant. And we see it in, uh, let's go to it, Genesis chapter 9. Genesis chapter 9, verse 11. So God has to give them a new covenant. Because the old one meant everyone died, and God killed them all in a flood. So unless God gives them a new covenant, they're not going to spread over the earth and multiply. They're never going to move 10 yards from the ark. They're going to hedge their bets. So Noah gives the sacrifice. I will establish my covenant with you. So God is now saying, I'm establishing the covenant with you. Never again will all life be destroyed. Now remember, God always keeps his covenant. It's, it's mankind that breaks it. God doesn't. Never again will all life be destroyed by the waters of a flood. Never again will there be a flood to destroy the earth. Now just think of this. Why does God even need to give a covenant? Because he can't lie anyway. It's, it's incredible that God gives you a covenant. God's saying, look, I promise, I ratify it, and he gives you a legally binding testament. Why would he do that? Because he's gracious. Next verse. I'll just read down so you can see God keeps saying, covenant, 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 covenant. But it, 
And God said, this is the sign of the covenant I am making between me and you and every living creature with you, a covenant for all generations to come. I have set my rainbow in the clouds. I think the original says, see, I have set my rainbow in the clouds. It's something God wants us to look at. And it will be the sign of the covenant between me and the earth. Whenever I bring clouds over the earth and the rainbow appears in the clouds, I will remember my covenant, the ark of his covenant, between me and you and all living creatures of every kind, never again will the waters become a flood to destroy all life. Let's just read down. Whenever the rainbow appears in the clouds, notice the, the clarity that God describes this, I will see and remember the everlasting covenant between God and all living creatures of every kind on the earth. So notice there, he calls it an everlasting covenant. So that means it's unconditional. One more verse. So God said to Noah, this is the sign of the covenant I have established between me and all life on earth. Earth. Can we go back to the chart, please, Ethan? Okay, so God's saying to Noah, you're not going to die. And they did commit sins. In fact, some of them terrible sins. Some of uh, Noah's sons committed terrible sins. But God gave the unconditional covenant, I'm not going to flood the earth again. The covenant wasn't just made with Noah, although we call it the Noah covenant. It was made with all creation. So God has now instituted a time of grace. The sins are just the same, right? After, after Noah, the sins of mankind carried on just as, as they were before Noah. Some of it wasn't quite as bad because the, the demonic infiltration had not happened through the Nephilim in the same way, although that's, that's happening now and increasing. And so he gives an unconditional covenant. Now, what's the sign? That final one there, what was the sign of the covenant? Rainbow. Is there a rainbow in heaven? Yes, there is a rainbow in heaven. Revelation chapter 4, verse 3. Revelation 4, verse 3. And the one who sat there had the appearance of jasper and ruby, a rainbow that shone like an emerald encircled the throne. There's the rainbows mentioned uh, uh, again later on in Revelation in chapter 10, chapter 10, verse 1. So the sign isn't just something you see on earth. The sign of that covenant is in heaven. God sees it. It's round his throne. So God is still today showing grace. He's not going to flood and, and wash the earth. There is a judgment coming. That's a different kind of judgment through fire. But the everlasting covenant of Noah still stands. Still stands tonight. We've... we've it's an unconditional covenant. It's a good job. Or we'd have all got to wipe Noah out a week later. You know, they wouldn't have gone a month without, if God was going to judge sin by getting rid, he'd have had to do it straight away again. Right? And we're a lot more sinful than Noah was. So it's a good job God gave that covenant, the second covenant that we mentioned here. Okay, can we go back to the chart, please, Ethan? So in heaven, we see this covenant is still there. In Revelation, this covenant is mentioned. So there's a progression through the covenants. God's not just making promises and promises. He's not just saying, oh, go on then, I'll give you something else. Oh, go on then, I'll give you something else. Oh, I'll, I'll forgive that, I'll do that. He's not. God's covenants is a path of redemption. He's entering into legally binding agreements to bring mankind back to his God's original purpose. That's what the covenants are. He's making promises and he's getting us to agree things so that mankind to agree things so that he can get you back to what he wants. And the ultimate reality of this is the eternal state. And that's why the covenants are in heaven as well on earth. So a thousand years later, 2000 BC, 2,000 years after Adam, God decides to bring another covenant. You bring that down. Now, we tend to call this one 
the Abrahamic covenant. Um, I've given several examples there, but can we go to Genesis chapter 12? Genesis chapter 12 and verse 1. This is where God first mentions it, and then he ratifies it uh, later. Now, God's first mentioning something is not the covenant. The covenant is when God ratifies it and legally sanctifies it, binding judicially through a ceremony of berit, covenant. Now, that word berit in Hebrew literally means to cut open, to cut. In fact, the Hebrew phrase covenant is to cut a covenant. So when you enter into a covenant, something's got to be cut, right? When, when God gave that covenant with Noah, Noah had cut an animal and there were a sacrifice and the covenant is ratified. And so God now is mentioning the covenant to Abraham. So the Lord said to Abraham, go from your country, your people and your father's household to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation. I will bless you. I will make your name great and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So God gives the statement of his blessing. Now the word covenant's not mentioned there. God doesn't use the word covenant until Abraham gets into the promised land. If you like, that's the promise. A promise and a covenant are different. A promise isn't legally binding, a covenant is. Now your promise should be as good as your word. God's promise should be enough. He shouldn't have to give a covenant, but he does. But he doesn't use the word covenant. And so Abraham went and he goes to the promised land and he's there for a while. Now, if you go to Genesis 15, verse 17, Genesis 15, verse 17. So when he's in the promised land, Abraham's sort of saying, well, I've still no son and I still own no land. And I'm, I'm, I'm coming up to 100 years old. So your promise doesn't look so good. It's a little bit what we looked at when Joseph preached this morning, Zachariah. It's like, Lord, I'm old and my wife's old and where's the promise that you gave? It, it seems a bit late. It's not coming. And so God tells Abraham, cut animals in half and arrange them down one side and down the other side. Now, what the Caesarean vassal covenant was, you would cut animals in half that's what very means, covenant, cut in half. And you would put half the animal on one side and half the animal on the other side. And then both parties in the covenant would walk between the animals. And you would swear an oath as you sacrifice this to God. You would swear in the name of your God that so be it unto you to be cut into pieces if you do not fulfill the, the requirements of this covenant. It was, it, there was nothing more important than a covenant. And so Abraham did that. And as the sun had set and darkness had fallen, a smoking brazier, a, a fire in a, in a pot, with a blazing torch appeared and passed between the pieces of the animals. Right? Next verse. On that day, the Lord made a covenant, berit, cut in two, with Abraham and said to your descendants, I will give this land from the Wadi of Egypt to the great river Euphrates. And then he lists all uh, the pieces of land that he's going to give to Abraham and his descendants. All the tribes there, just go to verse 21. And those there, the Ammonites, the Canaanites, the, the Gershites, and the Jebusites, all the land of Israel as we now know it. So God, through a covenant, not just the promise, he gave the promise years before. Now he cuts it. Now, Abraham and God walked between both pieces of the animals. No. Abraham fell asleep. And God did it anyway. So in other words, 
God bound himself to the covenant to give the land of Israel to Abraham's children. And he swore an oath in a legally binding covenant to do so. Okay? Now, is that conditional or unconditional? It's unconditional. Abraham didn't do anything. Did he? There was no, there was no legally binding agreement on Abraham. The legally binding agreement was on God's ability to keep the covenant. So it's an unconditional covenant, isn't it? It's unconditional. And it's, it's what we call the land covenant. Now go to Genesis 17 verse 2. So he does that. Now go to Genesis 17 verse 2. And then later, a bit later, God then comes to Abraham again and says, I will make my covenant. He's already made the covenant. I will make my covenant between me and you, and you will greatly increase your numbers. Abraham fell face down and God said to him, as for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many Nations. So now God is promising Abraham. In fact, let's just read down, get the whole context here. No longer will you be called Abraham, you will you'll be called Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful, I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. Just keep going. I will establish my covenant, God's covenant with Abraham, between me and you and your descendants after you for generations to come to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. Verse 8, the whole land of Canaan where you now reside as a foreigner, I will give you as an everlasting possession. Is God a liar? To you and your descendants after you, and I will be their God. What did Abraham do? Abraham just agreed it. In fact, if you go, if you go actually to back to Genesis 15 when he made the covenant, Genesis 15, 6, there is something Abraham did. Abraham believed the Lord and God credited it to him as righteousness. So in other words, Abraham fulfilled the covenant by believing God. That's the phrase that Paul quotes the most. You believe God and it will be credited to you as righteousness. But what about fulfilling the covenant? God will fulfill the covenant. You believe him. Right? Now, there was a sign of that covenant. It's the sign of circumcision. Um, but it was an unconditional covenant. Um, some people even split this, they call a bit of it the Palestinian covenant, which I think is a, not a very good term to use, to be honest, because God even says, even if your children reject me and get, get sent into captivity to all the nations of the world, God says in Deuteronomy, I'll still bring them back and give them the land. And he said that 4,000 years ago. 4,000 years ago, God said, even if... You are scattered to the uttermost parts of the earth. I will bring you back. Now that's an amazing covenant. And mankind hates that covenant. And the nations of the world today are saying that's not true. Well, it is. Because God cannot break his covenant. Because the Ark of the Covenant is still in heaven. The rainbow's still in heaven. The fruit's still in heaven. The temple's still in heaven. The covenant is still legally true. So God is going to keep that covenant. The covenant of circumcision was there. Are there Jews in the eternal state? Yes. There's at least 144,000 of them. There's at least 12,000 from every tribe. So God is going to keep that promise to Abraham. There's a lot more than that, by the way. There's all the righteous 
you know, children of Abraham throughout the generations. But in that last stage, there's still going to be a, a huge remnant that's saved. So God's going to keep the covenant. That covenant's going to be in heaven, and we're going to see the fruit of that in the eternal state. Yeah? Okay. Go to Exodus 24, verse 6. Exodus 24, verse 6. This is where people get confused. Exodus 24, verse 6. So, over 400, between 400 and 500 years later, actually, yeah, much like, yeah, about that. Moses comes to save Abraham's children. God comes to bring them out of Egypt, right, to give them the promise to Abraham. So Moses now, this is when they're in the desert at Mount Sinai. So Moses takes the blood, remember, to cut a covenant. There's got to be a sacrifice. Something has to be cut. Moses took half the blood, put it in bowls of, of the sacrificed animal, and the other half, and he splashed the blood against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant, God's now written the covenant down, the law of Moses, and read it to the people. They responded, we will do everything the Lord has said. We will obey. So what is now happening? The covenant is being codified into a legal system. We call it the law. We call it the law of Moses. Just go to verse 8. The people say, we will obey. Then Moses took the blood, sprinkled it onto the people and said, this is the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. So what's happening now? What's happening now is a law is being given to Abraham's children Best part of five, over 400 years, between 400 and 500 years, later, after the original covenant's been given. This is a system of law so that the people understand what the, the results and the fruit of the covenant is, the blessings of the covenant. And the people agree. Now, what do the people say? The people say... We will do everything the law says. We won't do anything wrong. Right. Go to Joshua 24. This is, this is Exodus 24. Go to Joshua 24, verse 24. So this is like another 50 years later. And Joshua takes them through the same process. He reads all the law of Moses to them. There's a sacrifice. And all the people said to Joshua, he reads the law to them. We will serve the Lord our God and obey him. On that day, Joshua made a covenant with the people. And there at Shechem, you remember they went to Shechem and they read all the blessings and all the curses and they all agreed. And there at Shechem, he reaffirmed for them the decrees and the laws. Just keep reading down. And Joshua recorded these things. Now it's, all, now it's all being legally documented. Can you see the difference between what they're doing and what Abraham did? It's not the same thing at all. The things in the book of the law, then he took a large stone and set it up there under the oak tree near the holy place of the Lord. A couple more verses. See, he said to all the people, this stone will be a witness against us. It has heard all the words the Lord has said to us. It will be a witness against you if you are untrue to God. You break any of this law, you've broke the covenant. Then Joshua dismissed the people each to their own inheritance. So now the law, which is introduced hundreds of years later, is a codification of that original covenant, but it's not the same thing. The results will be the same thing. But now, there are two different methods for that covenant being fulfilled. Abraham didn't keep the law, did he? 
In fact, if you look at Abraham's life, it's amazing how many things he did that broke the law. But yet, God credited him as righteousness. Why if he broke the law? There wasn't a law. There was only faith in God. And Abraham had faith in God. And Abraham believed God. And Abraham followed God. And Abraham did what God was leading him to. He wasn't perfect. But he had genuine faith. And so God credited that as righteousness to him. So we've got what appears to be the same covenant, but it's not. I suppose the best way to look at it is this. There's now two different methods. There's two different processes now. You can see the, the promise of the covenant's the same. The blessing, the land, the inheritance, the children of Abraham, the promises are the same, but the way to get there is now. Now there's two ways, isn't there? That's not the way Abraham did it. God didn't give Abraham a, Abraham a book of law and said, read all that, and if you break one command, it's, it's over, boy. You don't get anything. In fact, when God cut the covenant, Abraham went to sleep, and God walked between it and, and gave an unconditional. This is not an unconditional covenant, is it? This is a conditional covenant. Just bring up the, the chart again, please, Ethan. And this is where people get confused. And this is what Paul talks about to the churches and gets really annoyed with what he calls the Judaizers who are telling people they've got to go back and obey the law of Moses. And Paul's saying, no, 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 no. You've misunderstood. Bring the next one down. The law... The law that was given through Moses came hundreds of years after God's original covenant promise to Abraham. And God's original covenant promise to Abraham was unconditional. It was by faith. Not through works of the law. Now, what's wrong with the law? Nothing. It's a codified system of righteousness that if you keep and earn, you will get the same promises that were given to Abraham. Good luck. They would broke the law before Moses had got down the mountain with the book. They, they, he actually broke the commandments. I love how God never tells him off for that. God writes them by hand and Moses just goes, what's the point? It's like, I go up the mountain to get the covenant signed. I come back, you're worshipping another God. So can we see, in fact, let's, let's let the Bible tell us. Go to Galatians chapter 3. Galatians 3 verse 15. Paul's writing to the Galatian church because this is exactly what they've done. They've, they've got the covenants the wrong way around. They, they're using a different method. They're trying to get the same promises. So Paul's saying, brothers and sisters, let me take an example from everyday life. Just as no one can set aside or add to a human covenant that has been duly established, so it is in this case. Let's just keep reading down a few verses. Go to, go, go to about verse 18. The promises were spoken to Abraham and his seed. The original covenant God gave in Genesis 15. Scripture does not say and to seeds, meaning many people, but and to your seed, meaning one person who is Christ. Go down. What I mean is this. The law that was introduced 430 years later does not set aside the covenant previously established by God and thus do away with the promise. Just because God has now codified it all, doesn't mean the original promise to Abraham is now cancelled out. The original promise to Abraham is unconditional. God's going to keep that promise wherever the United Nations does. Israel's given to the Jews. Right? It's not my idea, it's God's. He promised it. I didn't make the covenant. That's not me making up my own theology. It's just agreeing with what God said. For if the inheritance depends on the law, then it no longer depends on the promise. But God in his grace, grace gave it to Abraham through the promise. Abraham is going to have the promise because he believed God. Not because he fulfilled the law. 
And now the Jews are trying to keep the law and Christians and Muslims, we're all trying to keep a law thinking that will give you righteousness. It was never going to work. The righteousness that God accepts is faith. Believing him. That's the covenant God made. The other one was just to show you how the law is codified. You'll not keep that. You won't do that. It's not wrong. It's perfectly legitimate. You know, and we have to keep, we have to use examples. If I said to my wife, let me give you this example. If I said to my, before she was my wife, if I said, darling, I want to enter into covenant with you in marriage. We're going to get married. But in our prenuptial agreement, our covenant, um, right, here's what we'll do. I'll, 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 I'll say yes at, the, at our ceremony, but during our first year, you've got to go out to work and earn 10 billion pounds, and, and you have to give it all to me, and then at the end of year, the year, if you do that, I'm going to sit at home and watch football, but at the end of the year, if you do that, I'll stay married to you. What do you mean, no? <laughs> it's me we're talking about. She, she might want to say yes. You don't listen to her. She, just, I'm not marrying her. Get, you, get her in order. You can't, you can't. I, my covenant's not with you. With you, it's more than 10 billion, it's 100 billion. <laughs> right? So, you might think about that. Now, you obviously would think, I'd do anything to marry Dave. <laughs> but, I can't do that. Even if I did go out and work for you and you stay home and watch football, I can't earn that amount. I, I'm not, I'm, I'll never do it. So, you'll divorce me. Because, you, right? So, it's not going to work, is it? Now... What if I said, I will marry you, my darling. This is our covenant. You stay at home all day. I'll go out and earn all the money. And at the end of the year, I'll come back and give you it all. <laughs> now, the end product of both those scenarios is exactly the same. We would be married and have billions of pounds, right? But the methods are totally different. One, well, they're actually both totally unachievable. <laughs> but supposing, you know, I could do, fulfill it. So can you see, it's not that the law's wrong, it's just that you can't do it. You can't keep the law. Yeah, but we've got another covenant coming. And he could do it. Come to that one in a minute. So you've got this covenantal... And Christians mix it up. Say silly things like we're under grace, not law. What are you talking about? We're under the new covenant. You're totally confusing what this is about. And so that was conditional. They never kept it. Never kept it. None of their leaders ever kept it. Even Moses didn't keep it. Moses was a murderer. He lost his temper. David didn't keep it. Solomon didn't keep it. None of them kept it. So out of these covenants then, so God progresses and he elaborates on the covenants by giving even greater promises. So the next one that is mentioned, go to uh, 2 Samuel 23 verse 5. 2 Samuel 23 verse 5. Once they're in the land, you see, you'll notice that although they break it, God keeps fulfilling the promise. God keeps, his side, keeps keeping his side of the bargain because he's gracious God. So now he gives a covenant to David. If my house went, this is David talking, King, King David. <clears throat> if my house were not right with God, surely he would not have made with me an everlasting covenant. Arrange me and secured in every part, surely he, wouldn't, he would not bring to fruition my salva salvation and grant me my every desire. So what's God promised 
to King David. Well, David's reiterating the promise there in 2 Samuel 7, 2 Samuel 7 and verse 12. So God now, not just David's a, a child of Abraham, he's an Israelite, so he's, he's included in the covenant, but God gives him an even greater covenant. So God says to David, when your days are over and you rest with your ancestors, I will raise up your offspring to succeed you, your own flesh and blood, and I will establish his kingdom. He is the one who will build a house for my name and I will establish his throne, the throne of his kingdom forever. Just keep going down. I will be his father, he shall be my son. When he does wrong, I will punish him with rod wielded by men, with floggings inflicted by human hands. But my love I will never take away from him, as I took it away from Saul, whom I removed before you. Your house, go back, your house and your kingdom shall endure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. God makes a personal covenant with David, saying, your lineage, your children will rule on your throne forever. Unconditional. No strings. Even if they do wrong and have to go through discipline, I won't take it off them. It's an unconditional covenant. It's an everlasting covenant that God has made with the son of David. Now, if we, as we saw this morning, go to Luke 1, verse 31. Luke 1, verse 31. So when the angel Gabriel appeared to Mary, you will conceive and give birth to a son. You are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the son of the most high. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David. And he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. The covenant stands. It will never end throughout the eternal state. Jesus is still on the throne. It never ends. God promised it to David, even though some of his sons were terrible and you've got people like Manasseh and wicked kings, God keeps his covenant. Jesus is going to return and he's going to rule on David's throne because God's covenants cannot be broken. It just can't happen. It's impossible. In fact, I love the way Jeremiah puts it. Go to Jeremiah chapter 33, verse, Jeremiah 33, verse 20. I love the way Jeremiah puts it. This is what, well, it's, it's God through Jeremiah. This is what the Lord says. If you can break my covenant with the day and my covenant with the night so that the night and day no longer come at their appointed time, then my covenant with David, my servant, and my covenant with the Levites, who are priests ministering before me, can be broken, and David will no longer have a descendant to reign on David's throne. One more verse. I will make the descendants of David, my servant, and the Levites who minister before me as countless as the stars in the sky and as measureless as the sand on the seashore. Jeremiah says it's easier to pull the stars out of the sky than it is to, to renege the covenant God has made with David. Can't be done. Now you'll notice there that he doesn't just say the covenant with David, he says the covenant with the Levites, the priests who minister before God. Because God also gives an everlasting covenant, not just to the children of Abraham and the land covenant and to David, he gives an everlasting covenant to the priest. So can we go back to the chart? So remember, the covenants have a sign in heaven as well as on earth. So the covenant law, that's got a sign in heaven because the Ark of the Covenant's in heaven and the law's inside the Ark of the Covenant. The commandments are put inside the Ark. So that's in heaven as well. Next one, David, obviously the covenant with David. Well, is there a throne in heaven? Yes. Is Jesus on it? Yes, so God is still keeping that covenant, although Jesus, that's his father's throne, he's going to return and reign on David's throne uh, in Jerusalem. And so the next one, if we can bring that down, he makes an everlasting covenant of a priesthood. And this is an everlasting covenant. You'll notice that there's unconditional everlasting covenants. It's the law that's conditional. We've all broken that one. It's Jesus who didn't break it. 
he kept it. So there's the priesthood covenant. Now, God gave two covenants to the priest. If we go to Numbers 25 and verse 10, Numbers 25 and verse 10, The Lord said to Moses, Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, so this is the son of the high priest, or grandson of Aaron, the priest, has turned my anger away from the Israelites since he was zealous for my honor among them as I am, I, and I did not put an end to them in my zeal. You remember Phinehas was the one who speared the immoral people with a spear. Therefore tell him, I am making my covenant of peace with him. He and his descendants will have a covenant of a lasting priesthood because he was zealous for the honor of his God and made atonement for the Israelites. So God promises there's going to be an everlasting priesthood. Right? It's not going to be broken. God, God said, I make that covenant. What, what, what did Phineas do about it? He didn't do anything. He just did what God wanted and God gave the covenant. He was just faithful and obedient, and God said, right, I'm making my covenant with him, right? He didn't agree anything. God gave it to him, but there's an ever, so that's one aspect of the everlasting priesthood covenant, but there's a greater everlasting priesthood, and that's found in Psalms 110. Psalm 110, can we go there, please? Psalm 110, verse 4. And the Lord has sworn and will never not change his mind you are a priest forever in the order of melchizedek the lord is at your right hand he will crush kings on the day of his wrath so we know from the book of hebrews that jesus is high priest forever in the in the order of melchizedek melech king zedek righteousness he's the king of righteousness so that everlasting covenant is still there it's not going to stop. Um, by the way, John the Baptist was descended from, these, from this tribe. So even though the Sadducees, the high priestly system, had failed in Jesus' time and become corrupt, God had said, I, I've, got, I've always got one who's faithful. You remember John the Baptist? He was of the, uh, the, the Levites of the priestly tribe of Abijah through his dad, Zachariah. And so he could stand up and prepare the way for the coming of Jesus. God's covenant always stands. God's, God's covenantal promise always stands. It's an everlasting covenant. In fact, God reminded them of this just before the new covenant, the New Testament started. The last book of the old covenant, uh, Malachi 2 verse 4. Malachi 2 verse 4. So this is God preparing people for the coming of Messiah. These are the last words spoken at the end of the old covenant. And you will know that I have sent you this warning so that my covenant with Levi may continue, says the Lord Almighty. Just go down. We'll go down to verse 8. My covenant was with him, a covenant of life and peace, and I gave them to him. This called for reverence, and he revered my name and stood in awe of my name. Notice God is keeping the covenant. The recipients, the other partners in this covenant, they aren't given a list of commands necessarily what to do, but you see from their response they appropriate the covenant correctly. They stand in reverence. They have respect. They stand in awe of his name like Abraham did through faith and love and obedience to God. It wasn't about the keeping of the written code, although there was a sign often attached to it, something they had simple to do. Abraham, it was circumcision, which is not a code. It was just something you did and then it's done. Next verse. True instruction was on his mouth and nothing was false and found on his lip. He walked with me in peace and uprightness and turned many away from sin. A couple more verses. For the lips of a priest ought to preserve knowledge because he's the messenger of the Lord Almighty. That, this is the book of Malachi. That word uh, messenger there is, is Malak, Malachi. And so the Lord Almighty, the people seek instruction from his mouth. One more verse. But you have turned from the way and caused your teaching so the priesthood becomes corrupt. But God's got John the Baptist waiting in the wings. Caused many to stumble. You have violated the covenant with Levi, says the Lord Almighty. So the Sadducees went away and they were corrupt. That's why Jesus had no time for them. 
That's why John the Baptist wouldn't have anything to do with them. But they were still faithful priests. John the Baptist was one of them. Who God kept his covenant with those descendants. Yeah? So to sum that up then, Hebrews 7 verse 22. Hebrews 7 verse 22. Book of Hebrews explains how the covenant works for us. Because of God's oath, Jesus has become the guarantor of a better covenant. Why? Because he's the fulfillment of all of these covenants. He is the last Adam. He is the greatest son of David. He is the greatest son of Abraham. He is the great high priest in the order of Melchizedek. So all the covenants, but not just the covenant we think of the law of Moses. Jesus did keep, he's the only person who kept the law of Moses. He's the only person who was totally righteous. So Jesus has physically, literally, and judicially fulfilled every single one of the covenants himself. But I thought only God fulfilled the covenants. Exactly. He is God. He was the one who walked between those animals. He was the one who gave the promise to David. He was the one who appeared to Abraham. He was the one who probably was Melchizedek, certainly the type of Melchizedek. And so Hebrews 7, 22. So Jesus is the guarantor of the better covenant. Now there have been many of those priests since death prevented them from continuing in office. So the covenant always fails when the priest dies. No, because we've got a high priest who never dies. But because Jesus lives forever, he has a permanent priesthood. Therefore, he is able to save completely those who come to God through him because he always lives to intercede for them. So he fulfills the high priestly covenant as well. So Jesus fulfills all the covenants, all six of them. There's another one. There's another one. What do we call that one? The New Covenant. Why do we call it the New Covenant? Go to Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah chapter 31. And we'll finish with this. We'll not go through any more tonight. We'll finish with this. Jeremiah 31. Verse 31. Jeremiah 31, 31. So this was way back in the times of the kingdom while they were all trying to keep the law of Moses under the priesthood, under the Davidic um, uh, royal kingdom system. And Jeremiah stands up, knowing they've all blown it. I mean, they were, they were so wicked in the time of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had already told them they were all going into captivity. But remember the original covenant, God said, I'll still bring you back. I'll still bring you back. Even under the original covenant in Deuteronomy. The days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. Right? So the new covenant is made with the church. It doesn't say the church, does it? It says the new covenant is going to be made with the people of Israel and with the people of Judah. The new covenant was promised by the prophets way before anyone even knew about the church. Way before the the church was the mystery hidden from creation, the Bible tells us. So we'll just read down. So there's, there's a new covenant. And the Jews were like, what do you mean there's a new covenant? What's wrong with this one? There's nothing wrong with it. It's just you can't keep it. It will not be like the covenant I made with their ancestors when I took them by the hand that led them out of Egypt. Notice he goes back to the covenant made under the law. Doesn't go back to Abraham because that was an unconditional covenant. The Jews were trying to keep the law. I took them by the hand to lead them out of Egypt because they broke my covenant, even though I was a husband to them. That's important. Because now, Jeremiah is saying, your covenant is a marriage contract. And you've broke it. You've been unfaithful, declares the Lord. Go down. This is the covenant I will make. This is the new covenant that's coming. 
with the people of Israel. After that time, declares the Lord, I will put my law in their minds, not on, not on a law code, not on a stone. I'm going to put it in you. I'll put my law in their minds. I will write it on their hearts. It's going to be in your mind. It's going to be in your heart. I will be their God and they will be my people. This is going to be totally different. It's going to be a totally different covenant. No longer will they teach their neighbor or say to one another, know the Lord. You won't have to know God by following a legal system. You will all know me from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forgive their wickedness and I will remember their sins no more. So what do we have to do? One more verse. This is what the Lord says. He who appoints the sun to shine by day and decrees the moon and the stars to shine by night, who stirs up the sea that the waves roar. The Lord Almighty is his name. God's saying, look, I put the stars in the sky. I made the earth. I created everything. I'm going to fulfill this covenant. I'm going to do it. Ezekiel talks about it in chapter 36, but will not go there. What we are most familiar with is Matthew 26, 26. So that's Jeremiah. Jeremiah is prophesying around 600 BC, just before the captivity and, and up to the captivity in 586 BC. Now Jesus is here. While they were eating, Jesus took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took a cup and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. Now notice this, if you've been listening. This is my blood of the new covenant. He repeats exactly the same words that Moses said. Except he says, my blood. I'm cutting a covenant. Moses cut the animal up. Jesus says, they're going to cut me up. And I'm going to fulfill it. This is my blood of the covenant. Moses said, this is the blood of the covenant. Jesus says, it's my blood. Now, some, that version there, but it, it, that word new covenant is in the Gospels. Some translations take it out in Matthew, but it's in the other Gospels. He literally says, this is my blood of the new covenant covenant it is an everlasting covenant for the forgiveness of sins it fulfills all the other covenants even the law covenant because he fulfills it and it is a marriage covenant how do you fulfill the marriage covenant how do you fulfill the marriage covenant you just love one another I don't know about your marriages, but me and Carolyn don't have a set of rules as to what we can and can't do. There's only one rule. We have to love each other and not give ourselves to somebody else. That's really it. And that's the covenant that Jesus ratifies with us in his blood. The new covenant has been fulfilled. Jesus has done it. The marriage covenant is totally fulfilled. Jesus has given us the greater promises so can we go to the chart then and let's close with this so when we take in the bread and wine we're remembering that the covenant is fulfilled the new covenant all the covenants jesus fulfilled them all and in heaven there's the signs of the covenants fulfilled the fruits there the rainbows there the jews are there through the sign of circumcision number 17 that's where the, the law is put in the ark the ark of the covenant is in heaven the thrones in in heaven the lambs in heaven the the bread and wine that we celebrate on earth we're going to we're going to live with him and have food in heaven it's all fulfilled so let's remember the eternal state is the fulfillment of all these covenants it's the lamb forever. It's the thrones forever. It's grace forever. It's eternity and life with Jesus forever. Praise his name. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads. Father, we thank you 
that you have set eternity in our hearts and we know that this eternal state is what you have planned from the beginning. You have planned a perfect man walking with his perfect bride in paradise for all eternity. You did it in Eden, you're gonna fulfill it in the new heavens and the new earth where your bride is gonna walk with you. So Lord, let your blessing be upon us as we ponder your truths and as we walk with you from now throughout all eternity with our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. God bless you all.